I thought about it just in terms of how John's personality lit up a whole room. Like he had that amazing ability to walk into any space and just light it, light it up. And I would never think of men attempting suicide as a teenager. I uh, literally woke up uh, one day in my early to mid 40s and um, had a childhood experience or experiences come back to me in a really catastrophic way. And uh, for whatever reason and the state of mind I was in, I felt I needed to do what I could to destroy myself. And so I packed up and left my family and more or less moved down to the downtown east side. Uh, well, he wasn't going to use the Lionsgate Bridge, but I'll use that analogy. Uh, we all had a hold of that bungee cord and we pulled him back. We started out with the basic idea that there was a discordant relationship between men's low rates of diagnosed depression and high rates of suicide. So we wanted to explore male suicide with people who had direct and indirect experiences of having lost a male uh, to suicide. Sometimes when you uh, write a project, you're, you're not really sure how it'll play out. We were delighted with what happened in the process of the participants developing their art with Foster. I could feel the movement in the bridge, the, not only the cars going across, but the swaying. And I started thinking about Jeff, and I started thinking about my mother. And I just, I just stood there for a while, I looked over, nobody stopped, not, a, not that I expected anybody to. But I just went, not today. That's my brother Jeff. He uh, took his life about uh, nearly two years ago. He was a troubled soul, led a very dark life, um, up and down, and, and towards the end he was out of work, uh, was dealing with the effects of diabetes, feeling a lot of pain. He had been planning uh, his exit for a bit of time. That's my uh, new good friend, Ron. I've come to know him and love him over, uh, over these past only few months, and I've gotten to know him quite well. Just recently, he's been uh, having thoughts about taking his life. He, he's, he's a very strong person, uh, very warm heart, very kind, very giving, um, but he doesn't see that in himself. Here's this, you know, for lack of a better term, a shiny, happy person on the outside, but there's a lot of dark, darkness and turmoil going on within him. I was thinking about suicide and, and thinking that there is a way out. You know, your thoughts and your feelings, what you're going through, you feel like you're the only person. You're the only person that this is, you're, is experiencing this. Well, you're not. You know, my brother experienced it. He found his way out. Ron was experiencing it. Thankfully, he didn't find his way out, and I didn't jump off the bridge. So, uh, you know, whether it was the rumbling on Lion's Gate that got my head, you know, snapped me out of it or whatnot, or realizing that, hey, things aren't that bad. The sun's going to come up tomorrow. You know, babies are going to be born and puppies are going to bark and, 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 you know, there's going to be a brighter day ahead was very, very useful 
in terms of thinking about those things. It's not all that dark and bleak. It really isn't. I've lost my brother. I've lost a couple of other male friends due to, due, due to various other things. I think the, the key for me is I didn't want to lose Ron. <laughs> okay. a friend by the name of John. It wasn't spoken about in our inner circle, but we just kind of, we just kind of knew John was depressed at times. And that's kind of how we phrased it, and that was our language. He even tried committing suicide as a child, um, like in early elementary school. I think he was about eight or nine, which I didn't know about till actually after he had passed. Um, yeah, so I think he, I think he struggled his whole life with those feelings, yeah. And I can't imagine what that would actually feel like. My best friend at the time was dating him, so it was her partner. They had plans and he came home late and he was, he was intoxicated when he came home. His parents arrived and another altercation uh, ensued. Uh, John took off and they couldn't find him for a while and his parents then found him in the shed that was on their, on their yard. It is very haunting, isn't it? This is, um, this is in almost every alley in the downtown east side. Um, it's a repository for needles. Um, this is just to prevent needles, hypodermics, from showing up on the streets. And this is something that you've partaken in? No, I have not no. used those. I've, I've never used heroin. No. I, pretty much everybody I met down there, I would call friends. Um, to this day, uh, the experience down there was absolutely incredible. It's a different world. People are very genuine in how they present themselves to you. They might be genuine in their violence, um, but more commonly, they're genuine in their concern for their fellow downtown east side resident. I think it's people that are sympathetic to their fellow person's plight and how they got there. Everyone has a story. I, I, I know that this is fairly standard in a lot of bridges around the world. Uh, the first place I saw it was on the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, there's something really sad to me, the statement that this makes to me, and that is that uh, our government feels that this is a solution of some sort to people who are so mentally ill that they're about to take their lives that if we put a telephone in a yellow box there saying that there is help, that somehow that's helpful. And um, it's too little, too late at that point. I mean, suicide is the ultimate uh, form of insanity, in my opinion. Um, it is the act of suicide, I think, defines insanity. So to have rational thought at that moment is, is really quite a dichotomy. Whatever the issues might be, they all seem to congregate at Maine and Hastings, at the epicenter there. Um, I don't envy the government at all with this issue to try and address and try and resolve. Um, but they're not doing a very good job. And in particular, one of the things that was very evident to me, and I've taken a couple of photos, uh, but I haven't demonstrated it very well, is that there appear to be a great number of services that are available to women and children, and very few that are available for men. And I, I saw poster after poster on storefront windows and, and government agencies. And very clearly they said on them, women only. So there are a lot of services that are, um, w which rightly so, are directed towards women. Um, but I think that there's this perception that men are tougher than, than, than that. They don't need that kind of resource. 
And I think it's important to recognize that a lot of these men that are dealing with the challenges, they're actually children because they're dealing with issues that happen to them, serious issues that happen to them as children. This is about depression and mental health. Suicide is just merely a, a side effect of depression. It's a symptom of depression. It's the ultimate symptom. It's the depression that causes people to take their own lives. So when we're trying to, as a community or as a society, address the issue as being suicide, we end up with these kinds of solutions um, or, or stabs at solutions, and they're not solutions. Um, it's, it's, as I said earlier, it's just too little too late. We were amazed at just how powerful the art was in creating a space for people to talk about men's suicide. It created the space for conversations that we hadn't anticipated and it also created a, a space where people who weren't directly involved in the art started talking to us about their experience with male suicide and it truly was an amazing exhibition. I mean I've accepted it now. Yeah. Um, he was sick. Yeah. yeah. Depression, alcoholic. Yeah. He got into drugs. They were like, she loved him and yeah. she misses him all the time. So how does this piece uh, reflect your feelings towards him? Yeah. So I had written, I, I did a lot of poetry when I was around that age and I wrote a few for him. One of them uh, is titled To Nick Who Hanged Himself, and this triptych, the three images, um, they kind of pair, they match up with the text. I wish you had waited. Uh, is that so selfish? I wish you were here. And so he's crossing the lights. Um, the red light says don't cross. I wish you'd waited because. For me, I think like we're all guaranteed a death. You were in some harsh shit yeah. there, um, yeah. but what could have been? You know, when when you are casting a shadow, that you're standing in light. That might be what you see. Mm -hmm. Be mindful that the light is on you. Mm -hmm. you know, I talked to my dad the day before he that he you know did commit suicide, and I understood his pain. And this is where we are now. Mm -hmm. yeah. This installation with Doug was based on a series of photographs, many of which were his friend Ron, who's on the other side. He compares their relationship to being on bungee cables because every payday, Ron would go on an alcohol and drug binge and have a massive high and then followed by a massive low. So every week, it was very unknown to Doug whether Ron would survive. So their images have been transferred onto bungee cables within a cage that you would find at an animal shelter, which is one of the things they like to do in their spare time. One of the photographs was a sign, Way Out. And this is the way out. This piece is based on Jessica's photographs, and her photographs are outbuildings where her friend John had taken his own life by hanging himself. When she describes John, she describes him as someone who would come into the room and light it up. So we've created a light show to reflect his personality. And when it's flashing red, are we seeing the warning lights?
This piece that we created together with Ian is based on his photographs of life on Vancouver East Side. So what we decided to do is to create a repository made out of glass. That represents how fragile many people are, including Ian, when he lived on Vancouver East Side. Inside the repository, we've deposited his community. So over the last few weeks, Ian has gone through his community where he used to live, and he's taken samplings. So there's the good, the bad, and the ugly. The exhibition's gonna to tour. Um, we're headed to Winnipeg uh, next year, the year after we're in Montreal, the same year we're in Ottawa. And we're looking to include as many voices in this project as we possibly can. I see this as a much greater opportunity to have a message spoken with a, with a voice much louder than mine. And as such, I wanted to contribute to that process rather than something that was directly integral to me. Um, to have local support in the community is wonderful, but these problems get solved with money, and that means governmental support. So uh, I hope it, it falls on wide open ears. Today, I am proud to be standing in this gallery with uh, bright orange letters out front on Georgia Street that say, Man Up Against Suicide, in 12-inch tall orange print. Um, this is a topic that clearly needs to have the brightest light shone upon it. And uh, I'm so grateful to being part of this project, and I'm so grateful to all the people that have guided me along the way. Thank you.